Uh, and uh, his subject is powdery mildews. And I went out into my garden today to uh, look for powdery mildews. And of course, I found some. And I say that as a kind of joke, because indeed, all of you have seen powdery mildews, whether you really realize this or not. Uh, they're all around us. They're uh, some of the most common of the uh, plant pathogens. And what's interesting about powdery mildews is that they exist in these two forms, a reproductive form that forms ascospores and then a conidial form. And what you, you see behind me here is a leaf from my garden. Uh, and what you see is the uh, white powdery mass on the surface of the leaf. And that's what gives these their name. Um, and those are the, the conidia, the uh, asexual units of the fungus. Uh, this group, uh, the powdery mildews, uh, has really been revised fairly recently uh, using that conidial state as part as an important character in the classification. So uh, in order for you to really appreciate the powdery mildews, you need to hear from Michael. And uh, Michael, as I said, has just recently come to Harvard. He's a Harvard University Herbaria Fellow, and he'll be working on powdery mildews uh, with us. And he's perhaps corresponded with a lot of you who are here. Uh, it's a great turnout. So thank you. I'll turn it over to Michael, and we'll take questions at the end. Thank you. All right, Don, thanks for the introduction. Let me share my screen first. All right, I'm really excited to be here. You know, I'm excited to meet most of you in person that I haven't met so far, and I'm excited to talk about my research. So the title of my talk today is Restructuring the Worldwide Epidemic Spread of Powdery Mildews by sequ Sequencing Herbarium Specimen. Before I jump into my talk, I just wanna go do a brief overview. What you'll see here on the right, this is the sexual stage of powdery mildew. As Don alluded to, powdery mildew has this sexual and asexual state. Powdery mildew can be really beautiful, as you can see by the sexual state here. And I always say that I think that powdery mildew, you know, it gets a really bad name. People always ask me when I tell them I study powdery mildew, they say, oh, so you study that mold that grows in the shower and uh, no, I don't study the mold that grows in the shower. I really study this beautiful plant pathogen. So in my talk today, I'm going to start off with an introduction just about myself and how I got to be here today. Then I'm going to go over a brief overview of the powdery mildews and why I study the powdery mildews in particular. And then I'm going to get into the heart of my talk today, which is powdery and a especially virulent powdery mildew species that it affects an ecologically significant plant host, big leaf maple or Acer macrophyllum. And then last, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about what my plans are at the Farlow for the next couple of years. So a little bit about myself. I graduated in 2012 from the University of Delaware with a degree in agriculture and natural resources. At the University of Delaware, I also worked at the Soil Testing Center and worked at a lot of um, organic farms. Immediately after graduating from the University of Delaware, I continued to work at farms and, that, and this is where I really got interested in working at botanical gardens and public gardens. During this time of my life, I, I really, my uh, passion for plant pathogens crystallized because when you work at these botanical gardens, you know, you, there's such a great diversity of plant hosts. And when you have such a great diversity of plant hosts, you're also going to have a great diversity of plant pathogens. You know, there's a, a very tight coevolution between powdery mildew and the plants that they grow on. So I took one year off between undergrad and graduate school where I was working at these public gardens. And then I went to University of Washington in Seattle where I uh, received my master of science degree in 2016. And during this time I was focusing on control methods 
for powdery mildew. My master's thesis was titled Organic Fungicides for the Control of Powdery Mildew on Chrysanthemum Exmorifolium. But this led me to my PhD where I really realized that I was more interested in the biology and epidemiology of powdery mildews and not so much on the control methods. So my PhD was titled Epidemiology and Biology of Powdery Mildews and Their Host Plants. I was also the Integrated Pest Management Coordinator for the University of Washington during this time. And this gave me a real good hands-on experience working with the gardeners and um, controlling different insect and plant pathogens. So I graduated in 2020 right in the heart of the pandemic. And then I immediately started a, started a postdoctoral fellowship with the USDA in Beltsville, Maryland, where we were using genomic tools to better understand fungal virulence. During this time, I was actually working with um, a really common pathogen on apples called Penicillium expansum. And we were working with both, both virulent and non-virulent strains of this pathogen and doing transcriptome work to see the differences between the genes. And currently I'm an HUH fellow working on writing a North American monograph of powdery mildews. And I'll get into a lot of details of this at the end of my talk today. So now let's get into the, the good stuff. What is powdery mildew? So powdery mildew is an obligate fungal pathogen. And when I say an obligate plant pathogen, that means that it needs a living host to survive. And this can make a researcher's job very difficult. I'm trying to keep all these strains of powdery mildew alive on their hosts while they're trying to kill their hosts. Um, unlike other you know, pathogens such as Penicillium expansum, um, which can be grown in a Petri dish, powdery mildew cannot be and it, it, it it's, needs a living host. Uh, it's also in a, a highly supported uh, family the Eersafaceae. And what I'd like to really note here is that the powdery mildews, as Don alluded to earlier, is undergoing, the taxonomy and phylogeny is undergoing massive changes uh, within the last 30 years, especially in the molecular age. Uh, powdery mildew is everywhere. It infects over 10,000 species of plants. It strictly infects angiosperm hosts. And it's one of the most prevalent plant pathogens in the Pacific Northwest. And also since I've been here, I've noticed it almost everywhere. Um, if you walk outside the herbarium, you'll see you have powdery mildew on baptisia, um, on hamamelis, on lilacs. Uh, and these are just the, just the plants that are right in front of the herbarium. And in the Pacific Northwest alone, there's estimated to be 100, over 150 powdery mildew species of the 906 species that have been reported in the world. They say that you know, the Pacific Northwest is really perfect climate for powdery mildews and that powdery mildews, they like a, a wet spring for the germination of their asexual spores, but then they also like a dry summer so that their spores can spread easily and not get knocked down because of the rain. So why powdery mildew? As I just mentioned before, you know, it's everywhere. You can't go anywhere without it, I mean, without seeing it. And there's also limited research that's been conducted on all the different species of powdery mildew in North America. If you look on the bottom right of my screen here, this is a great example. Um, this is just a fungus that I saw walking to work on campus one day. Um, the plant, a lupinous plant, it's completely covered with powdery mildew. You, couldn't, you could spot this powdery mildew from hundreds of feet away. However, this species of powdery mildew was an undescribed species. And this is just so cool to me that you can walk in the middle of the city and see this fung fungus everywhere and it's still so unknown. And it's really, really important to understand the taxonomy and phylogeny of powdery mildews because this is a very, economically important plant pathogen and control techniques 
vary depending on the species. So when you wanna spray fungicides, which sp fungicides work the best, which, which biological control agents work the best. This is all species dependent. And millions of dollars are spent annually to control these fungi in the Pacific Northwest alone. So this is especially true on wine grapes, hops, and marijuana. You know, so all the different plants that people like to indulge in and some of, every, some of people's favorite plants. You know, a lot of times people ask me, you know, what happens if you eat powdery mildew? Is it toxic? And my response is that we probably are all eating and drinking it every night. So I, I think that, you know, you can't have a, a good talk about a plant pathogen without going over the life cycle. So here we have the asexual stage of powdery mildew in the upper right corner. And then on the bottom left, we have the sexual stage. And powdery mildew has been a really important study organism in mycology. Um, you know, in the past, we, they, the status of the asexual and sexual stages was unclear. It wasn't clear that this is actually one organism with two separate sexual stages. And powdery mildew was one of the main fungi that was used to figure this out. And this is because it has, it switches from its asexual to sexual stage very abruptly. So usually this happens in around September or October. So that's what I consider the best time to collect. You know, the sexual stage is so beautiful and I always want to collect the sexual stage. So right now is my prime collecting time and you'll see me in the Arnold at least once a week trying to find these uh, powdery mildews. So let's get to the asexual stage here in the upper right. We have the asexual spores known as conidia. The conidia will land on a viable host on the leaf and they'll uh, recognize the host and then they'll send out these, they'll, they'll germinate and send out these um, mouths which are used to extract nutrients from the plant host and these are called hostoria. And from these Canidia, you will get a mass of mycelium. And this is what this powdery substance that you see on the leaf refers to. It's the vegetative stage of the fungus. And from these mycelium, you'll get these canidia fours. Now these canidia fours, uh, as you can see, it's this chain of, of canidia. And from that, and these will be wind dispersed. And there have even been reports that one canidia has traveled over 500 miles. This was a paper uh, evaluating powdery mildew of lettuce in, the, in California. And then over here, we have the chasmothecium, the sex, which is the resistant structure for the sexual stage of powdery mildews. This structure is, uh, it's their overwintering structure. It allows them to survive some harsh environments. And within the chasmothecium, we have the ascus, which contains the sexual spores known as ascospores. Oh, and just a, one other note I'd like to make is that something interesting about powdery mildews is, is that some species only form an asexual stage and some species only form a, a sexual stage. And in certain climates, some species that form both stages will only form one. So then now I just want to briefly go over some pictures I took of the powdery mildew asexual stage. Here we have a germinating conidia under a compound microscope. And then here's a conidia for, so this chain of conidia. You can see how easily the wind can come and blow these off of the chain. And then here's just, this picture to me is just so cool and really shows the beauty of powdery mildews. Uh, you can see just this mass of conidia force. I once met, counted how many uh, spores were on one colony and I was up to like 2 million, not by hand, I used some techniques. And then here's just with the naked eye looking at a colony of powdery mildew. And now the sexual stage. Here we have the naked eye looking at the chasmothecium. You can see that we have different colors 
And that refers to how well developed they are. So the lighter yellow, these are freshly, fresh chasmothecium, and then the dark brown have been there for a while. And then here's a compound microscope picture of the chasmothecium. Here A through C, you can see the chasmothecia. And then from D to L, we have the appendages. And these appendages, you can see they, they're high, this species is highly branched. And this allows them to be intertwined with the mycelia and grab onto the viable host or um, host leaf or, or sometimes even just on the branches. This is another species. This is uh, from the genus Phylactinia. And Phylactinia is, is uh, really beautiful. Uh, it has these bulbous bases. These are full of enzymes, which help break down the leaf and make it easier for powdery mildew to colonize. And what I love about Phylactinia is that these appendages are kind of like spears and it helps the, uh, these spears will lift the powdery mildew up off the leaf. And then they're also used somewhat as a parachute. So the wind will pick up these chasmothecia as they're lifted up off the leaf. And then the appendages work as a parachute and help them blow into the wind onto another host. I was just telling Don the other day about how uh, one, of, one really famous powdery mildew mycologist, uh, he loves phylactinia and he decided to make his uh, email address phylactinia at gmail.com. And then there's a lot of other powdery mildew mycologists who followed and also use different genera as their email addresses. And I'm, I'm hopeful that one day I'll be up there and I'll be able to have powdery mildew as my email address. And then here's a scanning electron microscope picture of a uh, chasmothecia. And you can really see the um, polygon ridges on the surface of the chasmothecia with these pictures. So now I wanna talk a little bit about my research. So I'm gonna talk about two chapters of my PhD dissertation. And I knew that I wanted to study powdery mildew because I did it for my master's degree. But before I, I dove into my research on powdery mildews, I wanted to know exactly what I was working with in the Pacific Northwest. You know, how many species were there? Uh, where were they? What were the hosts, et cetera? So I did a, a survey of the University of Washington campus. Uh, this is in Seattle. And just to give you guys some reference, here's Lake Washington over to the right here. And to the left, we have the Puget Sound. So I collected over 300 specimens of powdery mildew from the University of Washington campus. That includes main campus in the upper left, the Center for Urban Horticulture in the upper right, and the Washington State Arboretum down below. The Washington State Arboretum, just for reference of size, is around 260 acres. So it's similar size to the Arnold Arboretum. Fr from these 300 specimens, I found 75 different species of powdery mildews. And I just wanna point out that when I was collecting specimens, I was hunting for diversity. For example, if I was in Boston and I wanted to collect powdery mildew on lilacs, I could collect a thousand specimens, no problem. Wouldn't take me very long, but it would only be one powdery mildew species. So I tried to collect from different hosts. You know, but this can be deceiving because some hosts, for example, on a viburnum that I collected, I found three powdery mildew species on the same leaf. So some hosts can hold multiple different species. Of these 75 different species, 30 had never been reported in the United States. So these are likely non-native pathogens. And also 15 of the 75 different species were undescribed new species. And as most of you probably know, it's a lot of work to describe a new species. And I've gotten through around eight of them so far. And the, the remaining are still on my to-do list. But I'm sure after I'm done at the Arnold, I'm gonna, I mean, at the uh, 
far low, I'm gonna have a lot more species to describe. So the two research objectives I'm gonna to discuss today are was one, to sequence and identify the powdery mildews in the Pacific Northwest, and two, to determine the spread of an ecologically detrimental powdery mildew species. So first I'm gonna discuss my first objective. So I collected these 300 specimens and now I wanted to know exactly what they were. I wanted to identify them. So in fungi, it's very common to sequence the ITS and adjacent 28S region. So I, that's what I set out to do with these 300 specimens. And additionally, I wanted to conduct a phylogenetic analysis of the powdery mildews. And the results of the phylogenetic analysis as you can see here to the right, just a couple points I wanna make. There are 19 different genera of powdery mildews and there's pretty good support using ITS and 28S sequences for most of these genera. Over here, what you can see is Leviula. It's nested within the phylactinia clade. However, there's a lot of clear morphological differences between these two different genera. So that's something I would like to resolve. Also, if you look at some of these uh, higher level nodes, you'll see that there is no support. The issue is that sequencing other regions for the ITS and 28S, besides the ITS and 28S for powdery mildews can be very difficult. And even sequencing the ITS and 28S can be really difficult. And so I, I really worked on sequencing these two regions. I spent a lot of time on it and I was able to develop a new protocol for sequencing powdery mildews. The reason that powdery mildews are so hard to sequence is that you, know, you have this pathogen that's growing on the leaf. And when you try to extract the pathogen, you're also gonna be extracting the entire microbiome of the leaf. So I can almost guarantee you that your uh, DNA is gonna be contaminated. Also, you have very small amounts of DNA. And what I've noticed is that if your specimen, if I sequence my specimen fresh, it's really, it was really easy and I, and I would have great results. But if my specimen had dried just five to 10 days, my success rate deteriorated. So I'm gonna go over the new protocol that I developed. This was, took me around a year of just trial and error. Um, but what we're looking at here is we're looking at the ITS and adjacent 28S region of powdery of fungi, and in particular powdery mildews. On the top here is we have forward primers, and on the bottom of the screen here we have reverse primers. Now, to deal with the issue of contamination, I developed these primers in red that have PM on them. Now, these are highly particular to uh, or highly specific to species of powdery mildews. And now to deal with the uh, small amount of DNA problem, or you know, as many of you probably have experienced, herbarium specimens are often fragmented. I do this nested reaction, where for the first reaction, I do very broad primers. So I'll use something like AITS here and TW14 on the bottom. And those will anneal to all fungi, not just powdery mildews. And that's for the first reaction. And then for the second reaction of PCR, I'll use PM10 and PM28R. And this will give me a product around 1500 base pairs. And I've noticed that doing the ITS and 28S region um, together in, in a reaction like that, I can get success probably up to specimens around 70 years old. But as they get older, they get even more fragmented. And then I have to use even smaller pieces. Now I always use a powdery mildew specific primer. I will have contamination 100% of the time if I don't. So some conclusions from this research are that I developed these primers in a new nested sequencing protocol and it allows researchers to sequence specimens over 150 years old. I think the oldest specimen I've sequenced so far is around 180 years, but I'm excited to beat that record at the far low. Uh, 
Uh, before my research, the oldest powdery mildew specimen that was sequenced was 20 years old. And this has broad implications for ecological, phylogenetic, taxonomic, and pathological studies. You know, powdery mildew is a uh, powdery mildew plant system is used in so many different um, areas of study. And as I mentioned before, this assists with identification of the fungus, and this has huge implications for control. Now, the second research objective I wanna discuss, it was to determine the spread of an ecologically detrimental powdery mildew species. So I actually came from an ecology lab and <laughs> The basis of this ecology lab was a disturbance ecology. So they were studying disturbances. And there had been a lot of students before me who were studying uh, big leaf maple, Acer macrophyllum. And what we've noticed within the past 20 years is that there's been recent declines that have been reported in this really important ecological species. Now this, uh, maple tree, it's very common in the Pacific Northwest. And in recent years, they're even using it as uh, for furniture and for a sustainable source of maple syrup. And what I noticed in 2018 is that I observed high amounts of powdery mildew on big leaf maple in and around the University of Washington campus and at higher rates that had been previously reported in my lab. Now, what you're looking at here on the right this is a big leaf maple plant. Um, and these usually have pretty vibrant green leaves. What you see here is that this tree is completely covered with powdery mildew. It's giving it this white tinge. And I wanna point out that I didn't go looking for a super heavily infected big leaf maple tree. This is just what the trees look like on campus in, in October, just completely covered. Okay, so then um, there were three sub-objectives of this research. One was species identification. I wanted to identify the powdery mildew causing disease on the big leaf maples. Two is I wanted to evaluate how susceptible different Acer species were compared to big leaf maple. And this I did through greenhouse studies. And three, I wanted to conduct a worldwide genetic analysis of powdery mildew on Acer species. I wanted to figure out, you know, where did this in invasive species come from? And um, where else in the world is it located? Uh, another thing I wanna point out here is that you can see that on this species, uh, this species of powdery mildew, oftentimes you'll see it follows the veins of the plant. And you know, if this makes sense because of course this is where the highest nutrient, the nutrients and sugars are of the plant and the powdery mildew is just extracting this from the plant. So of course, if I wanna identify a powdery mildew, I need to conduct both morphological and genetic analyses. What we're looking at here is the morphological analyses. So we have the chasmothecia A, B through D is the conidia, and E through G is the microconidia. In um, the genus Sawadia, you have this synapomorphy where you have microconidia and microconidia force. Unfortunately, I was unable to find a microconidia force for this figure, um, but that's what ticked me off that this was Sawadia. Additionally, Sawadia is a powdery mildew that exclusively infects Acer species. And this was the first report of Sawadia bicornis infecting Acer macrophyllum in the United States. And this was really interesting to me. You know, every plant or just about every plant on campus was completely infected with this powdery mildew, but it was never reported in the United States. And this can't be that from negligence because there was you know, a powdery mildew, a, a researcher at the University of Washington for 10 years who 
only studied powdery mildew. So I talked to some of the mycologists in the state and they all mentioned to me that they thought this was kind of more of a recent event. So the next thing I wanted to do is I wanted to understand, you know, how bad was this epidemic? I wanted to quantify it. So in late September of 2019, I conducted a survey of the Acer macrophyllum trees on campus for signs and symptoms of powdery mildew. What we're looking at here over on the right is we're looking at a map of all the big leaf maple trees on the University of Washington campus, on the main campus. The size of the circle represents the diameter at breast height of the tree. So you can see there's a lot of trees on campus. Uh, the arborist actually told me, just to give you guys a sense of how severe this decline was, was that 6% of the trees on campus were big leaf maple. However, 50% of the work orders are from big leaf maple trees because you know, they're losing branches, they're falling, and you know, they're really starting to move to planting other types of species. So I found 519 big leaf maple trees on campus. And of these 519, 518 had some sort of powdery mildew growing on them. Not only that, so I, I calculated the percentage of the, of the leaves that had powdery mildew colonies on them. And I calculated this to be 89%. So not only is almost every single tree infected with powdery mildew, but almost every single tree is completely covered to powdery mildew. Oftentimes you could barely see the green from the leaf. So the next step I took in my research was I wanted to conduct greenhouse trials to evaluate disease susceptibility. So I collected Acer species, seedlings of Acer species from throughout Washington state, and I grew them in the greenhouse and inoculated them with powdery mildew. In total, I collected 10 different Acer species. And what I wanna point out here is that big leaf maple is significantly more susceptible to powdery mildew than any of the other Acer species tested. And this was really interesting to me. And what I, what I concluded from these results was that big leaf maple is likely an evolutionary naive host. Now, what I mean when I say that is that oftentimes when you have this pathogen host relationship, uh, when they evolve to get together, they go undergo a co-evolutionary arms race. So, you know, the pathogen evolves a little bit to, become, to be a little bit more virulent, and then the host evolves a little bit more defenses. So they, they stay pretty much at par with each other. But when you have a plant that didn't evolve with a pathogen, oftentimes it didn't evolve these defenses. And, I, and my hypothesis is that's what we're seeing with Acer macrophyllum. It didn't evolve with powdery mildew. It doesn't have the defenses to withstand these um, infections. So now I wanted to go, go back to the, my uh, first objective and I wanted to use this novel method that I developed to analyze old fungal specimens to sequence the ITS and 28S region of Sawadia bicornis from throughout the world. I, additionally, I sequenced the IGS and tub regions of freshly collected specimen. You know, it's, it's, I have tried to use these two regions on herbarium specimens, but I haven't had success as of yet, especially with the ITS and 20S region. You know, they're, they're easier than some of these other regions because there's multiple copies throughout the genome. Whereas I believe like the beta tubulin region, there's only one or two copies. So it makes it a lot easier to sequence. Um, but I did have some success on freshly collected specimen. And from all the, the sequencing that I uh, accomplished, I noticed seven different haplotypes or strains of powdery mildew from throughout the world of Sawadia bicornis. And I just wanna briefly go over my collection efforts. So I sequenced 140 specimen from throughout the world. And this included collections from China, New Zealand, Western North America, all the way down to California, 
and east to Utah, and then all throughout Europe. 33 of these specimens came from herbaria, and they ranged from 5 to 156 years old. The oldest Sawadia bicornis specimen I sequenced was from Europe, and this was in 1864. And it was on Acer compestre, hedge maple. But this was what I thought was really interesting. I sequenced a specimen from 1938 from Canada, and this was just around Vancouver. And what this is telling me is that this pathogen has been present in North America for at least 80 years. So that seems like a pretty high lag time between this formation of an epidemic and the introduction of a pathogen. And it turns out with fungi, this isn't that unusual. That you, it's often that you get these large lag times between uh, an introduction and an epidemic. And recently, uh, there was a paper published in January by some researchers in Europe. And in Europe, oak trees are seen are really affected by a North American native powdery mildew species. So they're seeing the same thing that I'm seeing on big leaf maple, but on oaks. And they did a very similar study to me, and they found that there was a lag time of 60 years between the introduction of the North American oak powdery mildew in Europe and the formation of an epidemic. And so it was really nice to see that my research confirmed, even though they, they just beat me to the punchline of publishing. So I also analyzed the frequency of each haplotype based on host and locality. And I'm gonna break it down for you guys here. What you'll note, what I, a few items I wanna point out is that in Europe, we have the greatest diversity of haplotypes and on Acer compestre hedge maple, we also have the highest diversity of haplotypes. Additionally, Haplotype 1 is the most common in Europe and in North America and was the only haplotype um, sampled in New Zealand. It also has the highest host range if you look on the bottom. And it's pretty well established that um, the haplotype that is sampled the most frequent tends to be the most virulent haplotype. So I also conducted phylogenetic analyses of these haplotypes. And I found that they form two highly supported groups. And you might be wondering, you know, why aren't these two separate species? Why didn't I describe an, another species here? And the reason was that there, there's no morphological differences between these two groups. Yes, group two tends to occur more often on Acer compestre and group one tends to occur more often on big leaf maple and um, Acer pseudoplatinus. Um, however, without that morphological evidence, no new species could be described. I also construct, constructed a haplotype network from single nucleotide polymorphisms. And the big takeaway message here is that you can see haplotype four in the middle here. And that brings me to the hypothesis that haplotype four is the most ancestral haplotype and all other haplotypes evolved from haplotype four. And based on five lines of evidence, I now contend that Sawadia bicornis has a European origin. And these five lines of evidence are as follows. The haplotype diversity is greatest in Europe. I want to just point out that I don't think that any of these lines of evidence is enough to make this conclusion on their own, but all together, I think it makes a pretty good argument. And the reason that, you know, I'm, I'm trying to understand where this pathogen comes from is that with fungi, there is just a very weak fossil record. And um, 
So there's not really any ways to determine the native origins, especially with these microfungi. So as I mentioned before, or I haven't actually mentioned this yet, but Sawadia bicornis was first described in 1819 on Acer Compestre in Germany. So the type specimen is from Germany. And the oldest sequence specimen in the current study dated to 1864 from a sample from Europe. This was a haplotype four specimen on Acer Compestre. Acer macrophyllum is particularly susceptible to Sawadia bicornis compared to other Acer species and is likely an evolutionary naive host. So I do not believe that this powdery mildew evolved with big leaf maple. And so it's likely from a different origin than the Pacific Northwest. And last haplotype four is the most ancestral haplotype and is most associated with the European native Acer compestrate. This brings me to my other conclusion that I hypothesized that the native host of Sawadia bicornis is Acer compestre. Here you can see Acer compestre over on the right. I was actually just in the Arnold yesterday and I saw a good collection of these. Um, I think it was on Wi the Willow Trail. And really interestingly, none of these were infected with powdery mildew. So I'm not convinced that this powdery mildew is present, this Sawadia bicornis is present on the East Coast yet. So other evidence that Acer compestre is the native host is that the type specimen is on Acer compestre. Haplotype four on hedge maple was the oldest haplotype sequenced. And the highest diversity of haplotypes occurred on hedge maple. And now I just want to go over, based on all this evidence I've brought forth, I want to discuss my hypothesis for how Sawadia bicornis spread throughout the world. So I believe haplotype 4, the most ancestral haplotype, evolved in Europe on Acer compestre. And from haplotype 4, we have haplotype 3, 5, and 7. From haplotype 3, evolved haplotype 1. Again, the size of the circles represent the sample size. And then from haplotype one, haplotype two evolved. And additionally, from haplotype seven, haplotype six evolved. And now for the, the spread around the world, most likely due to anthropogenic causes, we have haplotype one spreading to North America, as well as haplotype three, and haplotype four, where haplotype one is the most common haplotype. Additionally, we have haplotype one spread to New Zealand, and it was the only haplotype that spread to New Zealand. And then haplotype two spread to Asia. Interestingly, we, we sampled a lot of specimen from Asia, maybe over 30. Um, some of them were even labeled as Sawadia bicornis, and we found out through a genetic analysis that they were labeled incorrectly but we did find one haplotype two. So the conclusions from this study are that Sawadia bicornis is a native pathogen to Europe and was introduced in North America at least 80 years ago. Again, we have this large lag time between the introduction of invasive pathogen and the formation of an epidemic. The native host for Sawadia bicornis is hedge maple, Acer compestre. Acer macrophyllum is particularly susceptible to Sawadia bicornis, haplotype 1. And Seattle is currently undergoing a Sawadia bicornis epidemic. So now that you guys have heard a little bit about my previous research, I want to just focus really quickly on what I plan to do at the Farlow. I'm really excited to be here, and I think this is the perfect place for um, me to work on powdery mildews. So the main goal of my research here for the next two years is to write the first North American monograph of the powdery mildews. And I'm gonna do this by evaluating a combination of fresh and herbarium specimens. I'm working with botanical gardens from throughout, not only the United States, but Canada, um, 
Costa Rica, Panama, and Mexico, and Mexico to uh, collect powdery mildew specimens. You know, you can't have a North American monograph without some of these other countries. So I'm really excited to see the results from, from these different places. And also, the plan is to develop a web page to share the monograph with the public. Uh, the monograph is going to be completely digital, and we plan to have interactive keys, um, sequence alignment, so that we can help researchers that you know aren't mycologists or don't have a background in taxonomy with identifying these really important pathogens. I'd also like to conduct a similar study to the one I conducted with Acer macrophyllum, where I determine highly virulent invasive species in the upper Northeast. I've been looking around a little bit and I haven't really figured out a great system yet. You know, lilacs are extremely susceptible, but I, there have actually been other studies on the spread of powdery mildew on lilacs. So I'm gonna keep my, uh, keep my mind open to different pathogens. And in, to accomplish this, I'm gonna do multi-locus sequence typing to infer the invasion dynamics of these different species. And I'd also like to obtain higher level resolution of the powdery mildews. As I discussed earlier, you know, there are some major gaps and I'm gonna do this by using a multi-locus approach with loci that are, have been commonly used on other major fungal groups. And I just want to go over, you know, how important this research is and by highlighting the lack of North American data. So there have been monographs that have been conducted in China, Japan, Europe, and the Middle East. And that shows in this data here. So what we're looking at is the number of powdery mildew species with sequences by region. So powdery mildew is thought to have evolved in the Northern hemisphere. So you would expect there to be a lot of species present in North America. However, if you look at Asia, 287 species have been sequenced, whereas in North America, only 81, so tr over triple the amount. Same with Europe, double the amount of species in Europe have been sequenced compared to North America. I'd also like to note that these 81 species that have been sequenced in North America, around 30 of them came from me. So, it, so if you looked at this data three years ago, there would only be around 50 that have been sequenced in North America. And that is even less than Australia, which uh, is thought to have no native powdery milkers. So there's a lot of important work that still needs to be done in North America. So I also want to point out um, that there have been 129 species of powdery mildews described in North America. However, only 51 of them have sequence data. So less than half of the, the morphologically described species have sequence data. And only 51 of these, of these 51 sequences, only 26 are reliable. And when I say that's reliable, I mean that it comes from, um, like the sequence comes from a species from North America and on the type host. You know, I'm, when someone sequences a species in Europe on a, a different host than the type host and claims that it's this North American native species, it's just hard for me to buy. And the Farlow, just again, it's the perfect place for me. They have over 2,000 specimens of powdery mildew. And of these 2,000 specimens, there are 82 type specimens. So I'm really excited to uh, work with this amazing collection. And then just my, my plug before I go is that I'm always looking for powdery mildew. Uh, I hope I cured your guys' powdery mildew blindness and you're gonna notice it everywhere in the environment. And if you see any, you can email me with the host name and where you saw it, or you can collect it for me and I'd be really grateful. Uh, here's my email and thank you. I'm uh, open for questions now. Thank you, Michael.
I, I think if we have questions, uh, we should have, uh, maybe you can raise your hands or uh, we can uh, take questions, just jump in. Can also start with these ones that were listed in the chat. If yeah, there are a few in the chat. You you want to go through those? Sure. Would you expect to see uh, the same species in the Sahara Desert? Yeah. So I see Nasir asked that question. I actually haven't done any research on powdery mildews in the Sahara Desert. Um, you know, I I just don't feel like I'm uh, can answer that question great. But I, if you want to email me that question, I'm sure I could do some quick research to, to see. You know, I know that powdery, I um, imagine that powdery mildew in the desert there is, there's been very limited studies. But, you know, in the desert here, such as in Arizona, we do get a lot of species. Um, he also asked, can powdery mildew lead to health risks such as respiratory lung diseases and cardiovascular diseases? I have not heard this before. You know, I imagine that we're all breathing in powdery mildew spores every day. Um, so I couldn't imagine that we're, it's making us very sick. Especially, you know, if you eat kale, if you grow it in your garden, it's covered with powdery mildew. You're gonna be eating it, you know, with your, with your glass of wine at night, you're gonna be drinking millions of spores. I, I haven't heard about any adverse health risks though. Uh, Faranji asked, how to control the fungus so as not to interfere with gross, growth? Thanks. Uh, that's a good question. So for my master's degree, I did a lot of work on organic fungicides. And what I found is that a lot of these oils tend to be phytotoxic towards the plant. So they'll stunt the plant growth. Um, there are some systemic fungicides that they use in the wine industry. Um, and the hops industry that works very well. You know, the plant can take it up through the roots and it, it really controls the fungus well. I, I also know that I just went to the Farlow yesterday and they have a great system where they have a preventative system where they're um, applying sulfur at night through a heating mechanism. And it really helps with controlling the powdery mildew on flocks. Uh, sulfur is a common fungicide. I think it was the first fungicide that was used in the 1800s. Luis asked, are all the Chasmothecia dark colored when they are mature? Uh, all of the ones that I have seen turn that darkish brownish black material. And that's a good determination for if they're mature or not. You know, oftentimes I'm going through the, uh, What's really great about the Farlow collection too is that you know the powdery mildew uh, expert, the world expert for the past 40 years, uh, he analyzed all the specimen already at the Farlow. And he'll, he wrote on many of the specimen, you know, Chasmothecia are immature. And he probably just saw that really quickly because the, the coloring or the appendages weren't really mature yet. That's a good question, Luis. One of the assignments that you could all carry out if you're uh, here local, go out and look at the lilac and the, uh, with the hand lens. And the lilac is just at the stage where there are chasmothecia that are yellow, and there are those that are a little darker, and then finally the dark brown ones. But you can see them on almost every lilac. So have a look. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. I, I can't find many lilacs that are not infected. So any other questions here? Everybody well informed and able to go out and look at these. Great, well, uh, thank you, Michael. This was great. And uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing specimens that you collect and send in and bring in to Michael. Yeah, thanks, Don. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye.